O'Reilly, thanks for watching us tonight. Do most American voters really understand what's at stake in the presidential election? That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo, and the answer is no. Many do not understand what's at stake. Now, I'm not being condescending, and I'm not being ideological. The issues are very complex. Here are three vital ones. First, the economy is terrible. But it's not just unemployment and low wages. It's the staggering amount of debt. President Obama rolled the dice, believing that record government spending in peacetime would lead to job creation. No matter what the propagandists tell you, that has not happened. Under Mr. Obama, the nation's debt has increased by more than $5 trillion. And what do we have to show for that? What? If the feds continue spending at this rate, the U.S. dollar will collapse. Confidence in our currency will evaporate. We simply must stop the massive borrowing, now estimated at $3.5 billion a day, a day. Vital issue number two, Muslims. President Obama is using a soft power approach to the Muslim world, and after eight years of Bush Cheney, that strategy was worth trying. Mr. Obama did everything he could to convince Muslims that America is not their enemy. Sadly, he has not convinced them. Millions of Muslims continue to hate the USA, as the recent Muslim assaults on America prove. Even in the face of that, the Obama administration doesn't want to change course. Here's what UN Ambassador Susan Rice said about the assassination of the American ambassador to Libya. What our assessment is as of the present is in fact what it began spontaneously in Benghazi uh, as a reaction to what had transpired some hours earlier in Cairo. Spontaneously. But that is not what intelligence agencies are saying, and even the president of Libya sees it differently. They're choosing the specific date for this uh, so-called demonstration. I think we have no, this leaves us with no doubt that this has pre-planned. Uh, the date, of course, September 11. So once again, the Obama administration seems befuddled by Muslim violence, which is growing. Afghanistan now in peril, Iran spitting in the eye of America, and Al-Qaeda reconstituting in places like Yemen. Again, the soft power approach hasn't worked. In fact, Mr. Obama's greatest successes are the drone missile attacks, and they are a demonstration of hard power. Vital issue number three, gas prices through the roof, and the nation has no coherent energy policy. If Israel decides to attack Iran, gas prices might go to seven bucks a gallon. Mr. Obama is well-intentioned in wanting alternative fuels, but his opposition to the fossil fuel industry has put working Americans in a very bad place. Where do you see your heating bill? So there you have it. Three vital issues that all voters should understand. In fact, I feel so strongly about this that I'm teaming up with my pal John Stewart to do a 90-minute debate on those and other vital issues. It'll be streamed on the Internet on October 6th. Details later on in the broadcast. And that's a memo. Now for the top story tonight. Why do so many millions of Muslims hate the USA? Joining us now from Portland, Oregon, Harris Safar, national spokesperson for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And here in the studio, Irshad Manji, author of the new book, Allah, Liberty and Love. All right, Ms. Manji, what if, if you had to point to one thing that makes some Muslims hate the USA, it would be? Hypocrisy over democracy. Um, while America, the government now, preaches democracy, it has propped up uh, authoritarian uh, leaders um, and also overthrown democratically elected ones. Where? Where do we overthrow? I know, I know you're talking about Mubarak and Egypt as far as propping up, but where right. do we overthrow? You know, a lot of Muslims are still very rankled by the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, which was a generation ago. But when you combine that with what kids are learning uh, about America on uh, university campuses, about what has happened with America in, uh, you know, South America, um, the propping up of those dictators as well. You get this big it, bundle fomenting yeah, against I, the United States. And you know that I believe that yeah. that is a very ideologically lopsided uh, okay, narrative. Okay, but it doesn't make any sense logically. Look, the, Soviet, we're not talking about the, Soviet, we're talking Union, about the Soviet Union, Germany, and Japan did awful, terrible things, yeah. correct? Oh, my God. Do and I hate so, Russians? Right. Do I hate Germans? Right. Do I hate the Japanese? I'm with no, you. I don't. <clears throat> I'm with no, you. No, I don't. Yeah. All right. So that doesn't make that kind of sense where these people want to kill you and hurt you. What do you think it is, uh, Mr. Zafar? 
Uh, well, it's, it's an important question to ask, and I think the difference here is that uh, what we've seen is that since the 1950s, as Ershazi was alluding to, uh, since then there have been many crises in the Middle East which involve uh, natural resources like oil, and we have sided with the status quo governments, the dictators and, uh, and kings. And disregarding the people, the, the difference is we weren't affected as a people by the Russians. We disregarded the people who are being oppressed by those regimes, and people remember that. And the problem then becomes that the current leadership, whether it's religious or secular, they misuse that. They keep reminding people of that to rile up the masses against us. And then when things, uh, isolated incidents happen like this childish yet provocative and, and vile film that came out, when things like that happen, then they will use that as a ruse to rile up yeah, people against the United States. Yeah, but nobody believes that a stupid film that nobody's seen causes people to assassinate ambassadors and to storm embassies and to try to kill people. I mean, that's just irrational. If Allah and the Prophet Muhammad if they condone murder because of a Which stupid film, then you guys got a real problem inherent in your religion. But let me get back to you, Ms. Manji. Both you and Mr. Zafar are Americans, correct? Well, I'm a Canadian Absolutely. citizen, but okay. I live now okay. and work right. in New York. Okay. okay. I'm so born and raised American. There's a reason why you live in New York, and yep. there's a reason why Mr. Zafar lives in Portland, Oregon, because this country is a free country right. and we provide opportunity for 300 million people you got all right it. now absolutely we're not the devil the muslim americans who live here if they wanted to they could go back to saudi arabia wherever they wanted to go they ain't going they're staying all right so this is irrational but it's irrational on the level of millions and millions of people you would never have this in great britain in france even in brazil you would never have this kind of conduct so then I go back to my original question. What is it about Islam that makes these people s have such hatred? Yeah. You know, Bill, I have been the hardest of anybody on my fellow Muslims. You know, I've written a book called The Trouble with Islam Today. This new book, Allah, Liberty and Love, is all about young Muslims who are striving to reconcile faith and freedom. I never deny that there is a problem with the way we Muslims are practicing Islam. Having said all of that, I must tell you, I don't think what's going on in the Middle East and North Africa right now is about Islam. I think it's about so much beyond religion. But they, use, they use their religion that's as right. an excuse and that, there you go. to and, do it. And what I'm taking so much strength from, despite all of the images of violence, we're also now seeing images of moderate Muslims, what you've Not been many. calling for, Not stepping many. up with signs, visibly and making themselves sorry. targets. In Libya, they Get away with it, but you couldn't get, a, couldn't get away with we it. We love Egypt. you, America. <laughs> right. You've got to there give them credit, though, Bill. Absolutely, because okay. they, because they could be assassinated. But why do I have to that? push you to give them credit? You don't have to push. It's me. all bad news. But I'm as more, far as you're I'm concerned. more interested in the in a in a culture. All right, that in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Egypt, yeah. in Indonesia, in the Sudan, right. Mr. Right. Zafar. Come yes. on, it's an out of control culture at this point. And I'll give you the last Absol word, sir. Absolutely. And, and uh, the only thing I take uh, contention with is uh, to kind of to imply it's any implication on Allah or the Prophet Muhammad. The, the, the fact that we've seen many examples in the life of the Prophet Muhammad in which he was blasphemed to his face and he didn't respond to that. If anything, he calmed his own people down from taking any vengeance. Uh, I think that's testament to the fact that Islam does not prescribe this. Okay, but many of your clerics are not teaching that. Not my clerics. Uh, the, the worldwide caliph of our Ahmadi Muslim community has been the, probably the most vocal. Right, but you know uh, what I'm talking in about. In the uh, Wahhabi sects and all of that, they're not teaching that. Which Very we are always extremes. quick to condemn and denounce, which we should be. All Muslims should be quick to denouncing right. such hatred right. and violence. And they and should, which we absolutely. Are. I mean, because we have to stop this. This is crazy. Thank absolutely. you very much, both. Very interesting road. debate. Next on the rundown, Brit Hume on how the Muslim violence could influence the upcoming presidential election.